Osseo. Osseo. Cherokee greeting. Truth is the philosopher's word for the artist's word, reality. I am artist and I thrive in an imaginal world of images and symbols. Uh, the theme for today is going to be the summer solstice and the um, strawberry moon and the solar moon and something of an international uh, get together in this like that. So we're going to have a location in this to start off with and this location is in Nevada. And in Nevada there is the Truckee River that runs through uh, Reno and started up at Lake Tahoe goes through Reno and it goes east all the way out to Pyramid Lake and some miles out east of Reno uh, there is a place it's a huge outcropping of rock that comes off the side of a mountain and it's called the uh, Court of Antiquity because uh, in ancient times people have made many, many petroglyphs of all kinds, you know, carved into these rocks. It used to be a roadside rest, I guess that's how it got that name. Uh, but more recent times, you know, a super highway has cut through there and has, um, you know, taken away a large part of that. However, there are still things there to be seen, to be found. But the access to it is very difficult, but I had made that access. And I want to start down here. This is a petroglyph, as it is, from that place, the Court of Antiquity. And I would regard that it's a Celtic petroglyph. It is actually saying BN, and this is the symbol of the Celtic goddess called Yabuana. Some would say it also might be a Bayoni of India. So that's her symbol. And also, the BN is also Boana, meaning cow mother. And down here below it, this is a memory ball. This is you know, the um, sphere of memory. Kyoku no Kami like that. It's very ancient, two or three thousand years old. So we have some memory going on there. And then with that, if we can go over here. And here is a Hindu chant. Upa Deka Ivakaram Varnish Niva Duhitar Deva Hi Suli Suli I pray to you as a milk cow, O goddess of night, daughter of light, Sul, Sul. Okay, back to me. Well, that's the introduction into Bell. I'm going to present here the stone of Bell for the summer solstice. Uh, now, Bell, people have other ideas about this name. Uh, because we'll say it's being confused or mistaken with certain things that have been in the Christian Bible. But this name, Bell, belongs to the Celtic world here. And I introduce this with Sul because the daughter of light, Sul, that's where Bell started out. And somewhere along the line, the name was changed from Sul to Bell. Bell is the mock symbol of Gran. Gran is the mother, the light of the sun, and Bell is the emanation of her sunlight. Basically, that's what it means. Now, if you can go over here to this monument, this is the stone of Bell, and um, it's just about life size of the actual stone that I found there at the very western end of the Court of Antiquity. There's no other stone like it. It rises out of the ground, 
as this uh, sort of conical, cylindrical. Um, it's a crystalline quartzite, like that. And here, up at the top, almost, there is a perfect bowl. I don't know, I'm going to call it maybe a couple gallons of water or a little less, you know, but there, there it is. And then there's a lip over it, and there's this inscription here, and it is a letter C. I'll tell you what that is. But all of this is the glory of Bell. It starts at the winter solstice. You can start right here, this spot of gold light, meaning the winter eagle comes up here and alights this. And that this is the winter solstice, and this is what begins the light as it comes down over the stone, over the stone, until now at the winter or summer solstice, it is fully in the light, and that then is the glory of Bel, complete sunlight. In Egypt, it's called Ben Ben, meaning Bel speaks. And uh, in, in, in Egypt, it was covered with gold. In Washington, D.C., they took one from Egypt and put it up, and they call it an obelisk. Also, uh, a Greek rendering of this bell stone. So, that's what it's all about. <clears throat> What's standing of this one is that there's an inscription on it. And this inscription is Celtic. Yeah. Celtic are people who had covered all uh, of Europe and down to, you know, part of the eastern Mediterranean and so forth. Their name Celtic comes from Caldet, meaning woodlanders. And they evidently were able to even cross the Atlantic and come over here to Turtle Island and so forth. And somebody, you know, that was certainly very knowledgeable saw this natural stone is coming out of the ground all of its own. It's not something that somebody put there and was able to put all this together. Now the language of the people we're talking about has retained itself in the people of Ireland and Scotland. So it's called, you know, Irish Gaelic and Scots Gaelic. Uh, all my knowledge is coming from the late Shawnee Carlisle who has instructed me in the Scots Gaelic. He was definitely, uh, I would say, a druid of the old Scots Gaelic. <clears throat> and that's how that I'm aware of these things. So to get back to what we're talking about here, uh, the way of writing, if we say alphabet, we're saying alphabeta. Uh, that's the cadmium, is, you know, the he Hebrew Greek alphabet, alphabeta. Uh, in this one, we call it Beth Lois, meaning the first letters, B, L, are called Beth Lois. And that's what we have inscribed here. This is B, and this is L. So there is a stem line, a horizontal stem line, and instead of having phonetic symbols, we have strokes. You know, so many strokes for each, each letter. And then there's letters that would, strokes that would be above the line, and then there will be strokes that cross the line. So all of these are consonant letters. And then to deal with letters or sounds, we should say that we call a sliding vowel, like ya and yui, there are other symbols. In this case, this large X here is to stand for ya. If we write it in Roman letters, we would write ia or ya. So basically, it's the sound ya. <clears throat> and uh, it goes up here to this letter here. Now, this letter here is from another system. That's what makes this so interesting. Uh, this letter is from Gaul. Um, I don't know the name of it, but, but it is a way of writing in the country that was also Romanized, Gaul. And the reason for using it that way because it says who, and there is no way in this system to write that. So the epigrapher here has written C for Kalman. Now Kalman is the dove, and the dove is the queen of the moon. And the moon 
rules the solar year. So that's why we're having this. Yahoo. Then we go down here to Bell. Yahoo Bell. If we take just this part here, exalted is the moon, is what that says. And then exalted is the moon, and here is Bell. Now, Robert Graves here, and you have this here, uh, in the white goddess, he's done a very, very good research on this. So, definitely you would, you would find this example. Even he has Yahoo Bell, which he has in his rendering as originating in Egypt. Exactly this way. There's a lot more I can say, but I'm going to leave it at that in this case. So as the light comes, it comes down all the way over the rock, so now it's fully lit up, a la glory of Bell. Now then begins the shadow. The shadow will keep coming up and keep coming up until it's finally in the dark until, again, the winter solstice. So here we're emphasizing again, exalted is the moon, come on, dove who rules the solar year, the queen, and Bel, who is the emanation of the light of Guren, the sunlight. So that's all how that we have this for the winter solstice, I mean the summer solstice. So back to me, and here in the Bhagavad Gita, the song Celestial from India, and this is in the book eight, verses, you know, 24 to 26, sounds biblical, but it's not. Um, and I'm saying, you know, I'm stating this at this way. Fire, light, daytime, the bright fortnight, the sixth month of the northern path of the sun, going forth under these signs of light, the knowers of Brahman go to Brahman. Smoke, nighttime, the dark fortnight, the six months of the southern path of the sun, going forth under these signs of shadow, the yogi attains the lunar light and returns. The bright and the dark, these are thought to be the world's eternal paths. By the bright path, one goes and goes. By the dark one, the moon returns. So that's how we can introduce this whole subject here of this. And I'd like to look up here following that. This is my drawing. This is my drawing, you know, equally expressive of the Stone of Bell as her, as a woman here. And above her, this is Selene, who is the solar moon. The moon is over here. This is her, Selene, or Helen. Uh, and that's my rendering of her. So we can have all that. Let me step aside a little bit here. And we go over here with this drawing here. Uh, also this week we have the strawberry moon. So you can see the strawberry here with, with the moon. To initiate this, um, this is my rendering of Hera. Hera who is the uh, mother of all gods, I mean, they call her, um, and everything feminine. And here, in my rendering, she is um, personifying the moon. As the personification of the moon, she is Hippodamia. And here, this way, we can say uh, how that she is, she, meaning she, and the moon, are figuring into this. All of this is taking place in the house of Cancer. This summer is the house of Cancer. And also in the house of Cancer, the late Shawnee Carlisle, a few years ago, had passed away. And I'll do something for him eventually. So that's all part of this. <clears throat> so also who rules um, this time of the year is Leo, is the house of Leo. 
Leo is the supreme solar symbol in the ancient world. And so all the things that have expressed that, express, you know, Leo, he is, we have, you know, have, have the honeybee as a solar instinct, insect, and that also is a way that is expressing this. Another thing that's very interesting in the old days, here if we can go here, at my rendering here, is also the change of the sex, the change of the sexes. And that is where a man, a male person, dresses as a woman, as a female, and females can dress in men's clothing. And so what that's about is that the first part of the year, from the winter to the summer, is the male time. Now starting this week with the summer, now it now moves as the female. And so this was a kind of ritual that in the old days they did. I don't know the details, but uh, I do know that they dressed you know, in opposite clothes, and this is my you know, way to figure that right there. Then if we can kind of go down here to this lovely little scene. Um, well here, this is a cow. And also I should mention, you know, with Hera here, uh, she's also figured as a cow, especially in the sense of her eyes. She's called, you know, the cow-eyed goddess, basically. It's like that. So a cow, you know, definitely figures, you know, here in her. And here, this is who we have here. This is her daughter, Hebe. And this is Heracles. <clears throat> Heracles is the god of marriage. And this is all taking place in southern Greece, they call the Peloponnese. And he's holding uh, you know, like a shepherd's crook because it's pastoral there. And that here, this column is also a symbol of Hera. These columns are meaning replica of a tree. Our word truth or true comes from tree, which basically means firm. And so that, that you see how it's made with the flutes in it. So this is, you know, the symbol of Hera, who is attending the marriage of Heracles and Hebe in the Peloponnese of Phileas where she has a sanctuary. And also, this here, this is uh, from Egypt. This is um, a scarab beetle, like that. And it is also a symbol for cancer. So we've had, you know, we've had a donkey for cancer. We've had a crab for cancer. We've had a turtle or a tortoise for cancer. And here we also have the scarab <clears throat> for cancer. So it's very emphatic that all of this is taking place in the house of cancer. And the ancient people really thought of Leo, the house of Leo, being blended into cancer because cancer is also the house of the moon. So that the blending of the solar and the blending of the lunar was brought about in that way. Here, this rendering that I have here, uh, this is actually from an ancient metal or, or coin uh, from Lydia, from Asia Minor, where the house of Leo is very, very prominent. And that's, I've replicated this image there, literally, Leo and the star Sirius. Now, we go all the way down here and you see this little figure I showed before. This represents the stone lion of Caia, which is an island rather south of Athens. And that this stone lion is a place where the people of that, that island celebrate, or they did, have the culture of the star Sirius. Sirius because um, it, it rises, the helical rising of the star in the house of Leo at that time. And what happened here in the summer, 
called the dog days, this man here, oh, there was an epidemic, that's what it was, it was an epidemic through those islands there, the Cyclades, and he prayed to the star, this is called the dog star, Sirius. He prayed and he made, you know, rituals or sacrifices uh, to that. So this is Aristius, that's who he is, he's famous there. And the, the coins that they have, have his face and have the dog barking. And that is the star, that is the star. So somehow they, they believed that his efforts to stem the epidemic uh, worked, it worked. And so they continued to actually have a culture of Sirius there. And this is also the location of the stone lion. And so Leo is often figured with the star Sirius. Is that all quite remarkable there? Now if we go down here, and we, we, we see this the two figures here. This is Pegasus. And Pegasus is the symbol of the house of Aquarius. And here, this is an alabaster vase from Corneth. And it has the paintings, this is 2300 years old, and it has the paintings of the lion here. Well, you've heard of Corneth because uh, in, the, in the book they call the good book, you have the letters of Paul to the Corinthians. Now, Corneth is just west of Athens, to give you the location of it. And this is a very characteristic um, vessel from Corneth, which has a lot of important things about it. And so these two go together throughout, and that is the Aquarius, and even though it sounds like water, he has a wing, so it, so it sounds more like air, and the Leo. And so these, these two are the, um, basically, core, the heart, heart cord of Greece. And the alignment from the mountain in Crete that goes all the way up to, well, Ida in Crete, all the way up to Parnassus and Delphi, that's figured, it's an alignment, that is figured, you know, as the vital core of the country of Greece. So we find that being rendered, you know, all throughout there. And of course, this is, here's, you know, my lion here. <laughs> so if I've made a, a good presentation for the summer solstice and the stars, um, the alignments, all of the, the Mediterranean has all been aligned over very, very long time. Whether any of that was able to extend over here to Turtle Island, we have some pieces, we have some fragments. How cohesive it was, I can't tell by now for all that, that has happened. But there are petroglyphs here, there is, you know, this stone of Bell. These are not the only evidence of uh, transatlantic evidence of people here. And here, this is all my presentation to honor, to honor all the people, to honor this kind of history, to remember her, to remember Shawnee Carlisle, and everything that has this remembrance in it. And then I can finish up with, um, again, a poem from Mary Oliver. She titles it, Stories. Do you know the old story about the stars, the hunter and dog, swan, crab, dragon, lion, big bear and little bear, the seven sisters there on the horizon? Call it pleasure, call it comfort, call it rinsing out the dread. All night long, the silence of the heavens remains intractable. The darkness is more dark than the back of the moon's silver eye and heavy as lead. 
This is why there are so many stories to draw each star into the mouth for a single minute to feel that white fire against the teeth, bearable, even, intimate. What happens next? We say, what happens next? And why does it happen? And what happens then? Because that happened. Lifting up the darkness by that much, the sun shone.